Okay, so welcome to our second uh, critical convening session. If you haven't done so yet, um, and if you feel comfortable, we ask that you um, turn your video on, but keep your audio off for the moment. Um, and I am going to uh, continue to work in the background. And Megan, whenever you're ready to introduce, um, feel free to take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Megan Liberty. Um, there is a car outside honking, so I apologize in advance if you get some ambient honking noise. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Thanks for the introduction, Karina. Um, CABC has been held since 2008. And this year is organized by Center for Book Arts as part of the Printed Matter Virtual Art Book Fair. We'd like to thank the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts for their generous support of Center for Book Arts Criticism Initiative and in making the conference possible. Additional thanks to our conference sponsors, the Brooklyn Rail, woo, uh, Sorted Library and Small Editions, Center for Book Arts and the usual in-person space of the Contemporary Artist Book Conference are on the unceded land of the Munse Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging and uplifting the Munse Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations and the lands in which you are tuning in from. So for those of you who joined us yesterday for our first convening, you may hear a little bit of repetition in this. I apologize, but I wanna make sure that everyone who's just coming in today has the background information for this session. So uh, Book Art Review, founded by Karina Reynolds, David Solo, and myself, was launched in late 2020 with Center for Book Arts to promote and strengthen book art criticism. It has many evolving parts, including a forthcoming web and print journal, a prize for artist book criticism, and a series of critical programming of which this event today is the start. Our goal is to provide resources for critical writing about the book arts. Our activities are built around an evolving set of core principles developed and maintained collaboratively across the community. We wanna engage existing critical writers to consider artist books in the topics of contemporary art we're already covering. We want to strengthen the quality of existing writing in the field, and we want to encourage new and emerging writers to write about book art. This afternoon, we have invited a selection of international scholars and critics to join you, the book arts community and writers, in a public conversation about how to achieve these goals. We will take stock of the current state of criticism for book art, identify what is currently preventing the growth of critical discourse around this medium, create shareable resources to, to support arts writers now, and develop ways to close the gap between book art criticism and that of other mediums. Our topics for these conversations came out of smaller private group meetings that Barr conducted, where we asked how to solve the problem of, of expanding artist book criticism. Our first topic this evening is approaches to criticism for activist material as artist books, which really comes out of acknowledging how historically publishing printed materials, posters, etc. have been so essential to activist mo movements, but are often left out of critical conversations about the book arts. If any of you are tuning in earlier today, Paul Suelas hosted a talk about urgent publishing that kind of really feeds into this topic that we're about to have now. And then after we go into our small breakout rooms, our second topic of this evening is gonna be uh, publishing as practice. What is needed to write critically about publishing as artistic practice? What role does the publisher of an artist's book play in content creation? How should we make the role of publisher and designer more visible and including that within criticism and discourse? And what does publishing as an artistic practice look like? Hi everyone, I'm Karina Reynolds. Uh, welcome, thank you, Megan. Um, and thank you all for coming tonight. It's great to see everyone's faces. Um, okay, let me just open this up. The first thing that we need to do is, um, I'm gonna share a link in the chat here for you all. And this link is where we're going to be uh, taking notes for the night. Um, so if you could all uh, open this up in another window, uh, it's a Google Doc. Um, you all should have editing privileges. And so as we go out into our small groups, this is where we're going to keep track of everything that's going on in these various places. Um, so in a moment, uh, we are going to uh, 
divide ourselves up into various breakout groups. Um, there'll be about uh, four to eight people in each group. And uh, in within that group, there will be two types of person. One is going to be a discussion instigator. And um, if you're a discussion instigator, can you wave your hand right now? OK, so one of these people will be in your uh, in your small group discussion and they'll help to facilitate the conversation. We also need someone in each group to volunteer to be a note taker. So if you are the type of person that is really great at taking notes, please volunteer yourself. Otherwise, you might get assigned. Um, and so that Google Doc that I just sent you all a link to is where we're going to be um, uh, is where we're going to be taking those notes. Um, everyone is going to be taking notes in the exact same Google Doc, so you're going to see everyone writing together simultaneously. Uh, the reason why we do this is so that we can create a collective resource for everyone who's in the group, but we're also, as Megan said, trying to develop some resources and guidelines for arts writers moving forward to tackle some of the ideas that we are, um, uh, that we're dealing with tonight. So, um, we are going to go into our small groups. You're going to introduce yourselves, nominate a, a, um, a, a note taker, and then you're going to discuss the first question for about 15 to 20 minutes. During that time, you'll see um, a few notifications that pop up. It might be a reminder of what the topic is. It might be um, to let you know that there's five minutes remaining or one minute remaining. And then finally, before you finish everything up in your small group, then you'll see something else flash up and it'll say 60 seconds until you remove, uh, you know, return to the main Zoom room. So at that point, I uh, just continued our conversations and then in 60 seconds, you'll automatically be whisked back to this screen where you see everyone together. Um, at that point, I'm gonna ask the discussion instigators to share out a few interesting uh, points from the small group discussion. So it will be 15 to 20 minutes in the small group. We'll all come back and then uh, discussion instigators can unmute themselves and, um, and share out. And uh, you know, if you have responses or anything else that you wanna add into the chat, feel free. Um, that is open and available to everyone simultaneously. Um, so after we do the first small group discussion, we come back, we share out, we're going to go back into those exact same groups and we're going to tackle another question. Um, does anyone have a question? Feel free to unmute yourself or type it in the chat. Okay, I know this is kind of a weird format, but I think it's actually the best way to tackle this. So um, thank you all for uh, being our guinea pigs and for supporting um, this uh, great effort today. Okay, welcome back everyone. It's gonna take a few minutes um, for everyone to return from their various Zoom rooms. Actually, it looks like it's gonna take approximately 26 seconds. Um, so let's see, is this just one group? It looks like- it I think is. it's your group and my group, Karina. Oh, great, okay. Um, all right, there's Sarah. Did the, um, did the Google Doc work for everyone this time? I think so. Good. I I wrote in it, but it had nothing. It has nothing to do with the questions that were in there. Hi, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> great. Ah, look, so many great faces. Ah, okay. so many familiar faces here now that I can see all of you. <laughs> um, okay. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, did we have a good conversation around the first question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you are a discussion instigator, feel free, unmute yourself and um, let's, let's share out to the larger group. I'll go. I, um, so one of the first things that um, we talked about was um, what is it, the, idea of talking about a different framework. So then what are what is the framework that we're starting with? Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to understand that part. And then also um, kind of recognizing that even if, uh, so the, I'm, I'm grossly paraphrasing, but uh, 
that even if a work is not not done for activist purposes, like everything is political. So, mm -hmm. so there's a certain level of um, um, standards or a framework that should apply, that is kind of flipping the question and saying, you should apply some of these to every work even when they claim that they're not political. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we, we, we had a similar, I think, sort of notion that, um, you know, that, th that it may be much more about applying maybe some additional terminology, but that it's, you know, much more applying, you know, the same language and, and framework um, to some of this material um, and also being clear about some of the distinctions, for example, that came up yesterday morning about sort of material that is produced uh, by people sort of within the community versus actually external people sort of talking about the, the topic. Um, there's also a question as to whether looking at the history of talking about protest material is the same thing we're talking about here or a, a different or slightly different um, element. And, and the challenges of um, having that writing hold up over time, and also of trying to write about historical activist material or even understanding it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we started off with kind of a similar conversation just to open it up of like, is there a difference between political and activist? Um, but one of the real sticking points that we identified was just like the issue of timing and kind of the, the gap between the activist moment, the timeliness of why it's being produced, and then the time that, you know, would be collected and written about and kind of enter critical or certainly scholarly discourse. Um, but, you know, the inverse of that is we also had like the example of the Center for Political Graphics is, you know, being an institution that can take something that is no longer timely, but has become relevant again, and then sort of highlighting activist work from a long time ago and you know Newberry Library does this on social media like there are a lot of institutions that I think are looking backwards in time really effectively and mm -hmm. even though that takes a long time to do um, that is certainly one strategy instead of trying to make you know do the criticism or scholarship or the find the framework for dealing with it right away of waiting and knowing that these issues kind of come back around. Yeah. I think one thing that was really interesting uh, in my group, it echoed a lot of the sentiments that have already been said, but also the issue of historical context as um, Dave and Levi were just saying, but also of the, the context of the reviewer. I was really trying to get our group to stay on what does this mean for approaches to criticism and collecting. So we had a librarian in our group, so talking about classification terms and if there was a need to shift the language around classifying these materials to consider both context and format equally and as well in approaches to criticism, if there was a requirement to acknowledge the reviewer and the critic's own subjectivity and our own position in history at the time that we're looking at the materials and how that impacts our reading, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, yes, I can, yeah. can follow up. Um, see. So in our group, we started with the idea of why do we publish? And so I, uh, we quoted uh, Andre Breton, we print, uh, we publish to, to, to make comrades, to find people to connect. And for me, for my background, uh, publishing is a, is, a, is a political act already, just to, to be able to do it. Um, we, sorry, one second. Sorry, my computer is... Mm -hmm. Okay, so we came out with, uh, we talked a couple of points, uh, the freedom, uh, one of our participants talked about when she teach her students, she don't like to make any differentiation between zines, artist book, uh, activist books. Um, we also talk about the period, which the period that, and the materials which the books are made influence um, what qualify as a political and activist uh, book. Some artists start out without the intention, but they responding to their time. Mm -hmm. We talk about the reason, one of the, the reason we talk about that recently is because 2020 and the critic 
the job probably is to come after this work is produced and to look at it and to, and to understand it and to, to understand the context in which the work was produced. And probably work that was produced last year is very different than work that was produced in 2019. It will feel different. And so it's, it's, it's not all in our hands, I think. It's, it's all an element uh, of responding to the moment. And some people, we talk about the possibility of people who responded and made one book off and never hear from that person again, that artist, or people who consciously think about it and, and keep working. So I think one of the conclusions we, we came out is that it just, we, we, it's a combination of the influence of the period in which we're living and the, to be able to look at it, somebody has to come after the fact to look at what happened. Mm. That's a great point. Um, so some, yeah. something we discussed in, in our group is um, like the functionality that activist publishing um, produces. So is it the act of publishing, is that itself activist or does the publication itself have to do something in order to make it activist publishing. Um, we also talked about how um, that could change in, in internationally, depending upon the political regime in which it's being published. Like how does that change the, the meaning of a publication? Um, it's great seeing, I'm seeing in the document now, how a lot of people distinguish between or ask the questions around political work versus activist work. I think we got a little bit stuck um, we for, we like we thought of, we're like is all work activist and maybe what we really meant was is all work political like all work is political but maybe not all work is activist but we didn't quite get there um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about right now. I know I already spoke about my group, but I just wanted to piggyback off of what Emily was saying and what Victor just said, thinking about Victor and your group, maybe we can come back to this later at the end, but I just didn't want to forget. When you said that your group discussed, um, someone in your group said that when they introduced materials to their class, they didn't distinguish between zines and other kinds of artist books. And I just wonder if there is something that I understand that kind of approach to removing the hierarchy of those, but at the same time, there is something very material, is there something very material specific to activist publishing that requires us to distinguish it from other types of artist books? I don't have the answer, that's the question. <laughs> I mean, I think we, we, we were sort of, and I thought it was a little bit what Emily was saying is, is that, you know, there was a sense that virtually anything could be viewed by the right person as, depending on how you define activist. I mean, one of the things we also realize is it's not clear that although we're using this term, that there's any consistent notion about what sort of activist, urgent, protest, political material is. And that, you know, given that in almost any book produced, you know, for someone picking it up and looking at it could be viewed that way, that, you know, was, was sort of reinforcing the notion that you know, it's not a different framework or language, but rather, um, you know, a, um, a way to respond to almost any work, which a little bit goes back to the all publishing is political statement, I think, that Paul said earlier. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we've ended up, oh, like, kind of following, I mean, we've covered so many different things, but we also talked connected it back to yesterday's session about intentionality. And then it was a question around, mm -hmm. is it about documentation or a tool, which Colette mentioned, and I thought it was a great way of framing it, like the red book being a tool or, a and also even the, a book versus a poster, a flyer or something written or printed off the cuff, serves a really different purpose. And someone else in our group said something like, well, is a book too refined to be activist? Like, does it need to be something that is super urgent um, and made in the moment and for the re, you know the thing, the protest or et cetera, et cetera. And then we kind of landed and fell into the very recent area of Instagram and the Black Lives Matter movement and how protest and activism has really moved to social media. And is that being archived? Does yeah. that matter? And its relationship to print as well, which a lot of times is about re, re uh, unearthing past print posters um, and reusing them in certain ways. So. Okay, I'm gonna send you guys back to your breakout groups, but um, our next 
question that we're tackling is um, in the chat right now, what role does the publisher of an artist book play in content creation? And we're just a reminder that we're thinking about this in the context of um, art writing. So, uh, you know, how would this, um, how would this apply to uh, someone who's thinking about an artist book critically, you know, the, 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 the publisher and publishing as practice. Okay. Mm. All right, here you go. Okay, is there anyone in the Zoom room here that needs a place? I do. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to put you into this one. And Mary, I'm going to drop you in here. Thanks. <laughs> Have fun.
Welcome back. How was the conversation in your room? It was really interesting, um, but were we supposed to do both questions? I got a little, we didn't ever get to the third question. That's <laughs> fine. We to? <laughs> well, you know, we had originally, we had them uh, formatted as two questions and I think someone split them into three today. <laughs> so um, depending on who wants to, if anyone wants to stay a little bit longer, I know it's been a long day, but we could go back to discuss that a little more if we feel like it needs more time. We always need more time. <laughs> yeah, welcome back everyone. Okay. All righty. So uh, how was that discussion? Was it a little bit easier now that you guys all know each other a little bit better? Yes, good, okay. Um, discussion instigators, feel free to unmute and share at will. Megan, do you want to get us started? Okay, well, we had such a wide ranging discussion. It's hard to really um, encapsulate it with any few points in this group. But I think it was interesting that our discussion at first really went towards more traditional models of publishing and how those are other types of institutions that offer levels of prestige or validation to uh, artists and writers who, who want to use them. Uh, we brought up points about how to uh, make more clear to the reader and viewer uh, the labor that's involved in producing books. And then right at the end, we start to get into really exciting conversation about other non-traditional models of publishing like Wendy's Subway and some of these presses that uh, engage in communities outside of just bookmaking as part of a publishing practice, but a kind of collective space uh, and thinking about those models of publishing as well. Mm, yeah. yeah, the notion of a spectrum definitely came up from sort of self-publishing to kind of the workshop collective models we were talking about, you know, certain artistic workshops, you know, in Latin America, you know, throughout the U.S. collectives, you know, is a very different model, you know, on to sort of various small and, and larger commercial publishers, you know, and that sort of understanding and, and you know, making sure you're clear on that model um, and often the associated financial structure, getting back to the earlier conversation, you know, is important when you, you talk about it. Uh, also the timeline for production, you know, and so, you know, how you think about something that is released in two weeks is very different than something that, you know, has taken four years to, to come to the light of day. And, and so, you know, thinking not so much maybe as a critical framework, as much as a publishing framework in which to situate some of these kinds of, of activities. Um, you know, also, I guess the last part was, you know, trying to think about distinguishing, you know, a activist role of a publisher, I'm sorry, different version of activist, role of a publisher in shaping something versus simply reflecting the taste of the individuals involved, mm. you know, and, and whether those are sort of different things. Yeah, just uh, Dave, your point made me realize, I also want to say one thing from my group that was really great in terms of speed, we talked a little bit about this idea of slow publishing and what that might mean, whether slow publishing could be urgent, whether slow had to have anything to do with speed at all, and just kind of ways in which slow publishing could engage with local communities and allow communities to have more agency over the publication than publishing in a different sense. Um, one thing that we talked about is just the, um, kind of like the need to dig deeper into the mechanics of a publisher artist relationship, like acknowledging that there is a spectrum that's really variable and that all of that is like a better reason to understand the economics, the negotiation, you know, who had what role and, you know, that that kind of transparency, like it's right at the tension between reality and the artistic vision. Um, and so that we do think that there would be like an appetite for that and that it's a story that critics could write or art writers generally. Um, mm -hmm. And that like it's sensitive and there's probably reasons people don't talk about it, but I think everyone kind of agreed that that would be of interest. 
Mm, yeah. So we we actually <laughs> kind of started going in a um, slightly different direction, um, trying to understand what um, content creation really meant and um, and yeah, so because uh, some of the people in our group were saying you know, they when they think of, of an artist book, and then they was also questioning what an artist book is, but um, they don't think about it in those terms because it's so it's so um, like what what exactly does content mean? It's 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 the design and everything is so it's it's much more um, integrated than maybe in other works. So so we we were kind of struggling with with that a little bit and 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 then what a publisher how that plays into that. Mm. Yeah, I think we, we also struggled a little bit with the first question, getting stuck on um, content creation and role of publisher. And so we, we moved um, on to the, the next question where we really uh, dwelled a lot on some ideas about the history of the book and um, how that, and basically the history of publishing, the history of the book, the way that books and printed matter function in different uh like around the world, like how that creates um, different environments for what something means or how it how it functions. And also just the, the knowledge required of all the processes that publishing is such a wide practice and everything from write, you know, editing, writing, selecting, designing, printing, distributing the market um, and the role of 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 in order to be able to write about that, to have some knowledge of each of those processes or some way of describing them or thinking about them in continuum. Um, and then we also talked a bit about the idea of personal publishing, um, the idea of, of like reproduction as critical production um, and the identity and context of the artist publisher. Uh, I can go now. Um, we were a little bit confused too. I think we we tackle only some first uh, because most of us who the, who have worked with artist books uh, had experience of self publishing. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I, that's what I've done uh, all these years, just getting to know the process mm -hmm. of publishing, not to have to go to to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but then different models. Uh, some members of the group talk about the woman study a studio workshop. And so a comparison versus the visual study workshop um, versus the different other presses and the difference between the books that come out. Uh, uh, the woman studio, for example, they talk about the materials are very different that is used for the visual study workshop. Uh, so those, you know, that we, we just got basic understanding. And so there is possibilities of, of uh, so we, and one more important, I mean, especially in photography, and um, we talk about the, this publisher who charge people to, mm -hmm. to publish their book. Mm -hmm. And so that's a play to pay kind of system. And the, what it calls the, the self-publishing to be more accepted, because basically uh, when you pay a publisher, you are doing uh, some sort of play to pay. Um, yes, predatory publishing practice, somebody said. So you had all those elements. So we talk about, about that. And one last thing, I mean, we, we just discussing, you know, oh, one thing I mentioned because my experience applying, um, which uh, applying for grants for institutions, especially who get public funding, is the understanding all these institutions. I mean, that was my understanding. I, you know, I applied for grants for a year and that was great. And I think it should be done. But all these institutions had a DNA on them. And it limits your freedom at a certain point. A certain point, you have to give up the grand thing because you have to adapt to to their needs because they're getting money from a place, and so they have their own needs. So that goes, and you know, that's my experience of ten years uh, being in euros and working for grant. And then, uh, let me see, so I don't forget. Yeah, we talk about the DNA of the institutions and how that determine the work 
that is going to be selected. And one last thing I want to do, um, uh, I think for Megan, one clarification from one of the, 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 the participants. I, I think we both, agree, I, we wanted to say is that we, when we teach, we do need the, 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 the critical writing on photo books and we need all these categories. And, you know, we talk about Clive Philpott uh, with Butrex and, and how that is uh, used and how we use it to create a historical context. But then when the students start producing work, we try not to limit or to, or to qualify them. We let them go wherever they wanna go. And I mentioned how I had students of colors from the Bronx or, or, color, or African-Americans, students who don't care for Ed Rocher. They don't really care for it. But I tell them, learn the language because this artist book, you know, learn this thing because then you can turn the language around and use it as you wish. So that, that was what we were, I hope I explained it correctly. That's what we were trying to say. All right, All right thanks. Learn language to subvert language, yeah. I, Ingrid asks a question um, or she uh, raises a statement that she'd love to hear more about the group's take on publishing as practice. And I'm curious about that too, because in the conversations that I've had with dealers and collectors, um, you know, some people feel very strongly that um, publishing is an artistic practice and, and should be treated similarly to the way you would um, assess an artist book. And others feel like it's a completely different thing. It's a business model. And I think certainly there's a full spectrum um, and so, yeah, I'm curious about, uh, also, Ingrid, I'm curious what other people think about publishing as artistic practice. Um, if I can jump in, I, I will say this is like one of my sort of soapbox things that, um, and just partly in terms of terminology, I think that people use artist publication um, because they think it's broader than artist book, like mm -hmm. that that somehow includes something that's unbound or a flexagon or some other structure. Um, as like a broader term, but I would actually argue that it's a narrower term and that you can produce a book without publishing it and that you can even produce an edition or multiples and distribute them, you know, through some practice that is not publishing. So publishing, yes, it's like a business practice um, or, you know, business model, but I think even broader than that too, it's, it's concerned with constituting a public. Um, you know, which all artists are supposed to, you know, consider your audience. That's like the first advice you get. Um, but so I guess like if anything, I would just want to push back against the idea of publication as a broader, more flexible term, because if anything, I, I think it's more specific than that. One thing I'll add into that, Levi, is that I wish David Sr. was here yesterday. I don't know. I think it must have been on the big group towards the end. He mentioned um, that he prefers the term artist publication or artist publishing, actually, for the reason you just said, that it sort of encompasses more things. So I think I wish he was here to push back against you so you guys could have a dialogue about that. But I wonder, and I, I mentioned this in the chat and you started to answer it, just this idea of finding a public publishing as practice to publish means to find a public. So how then do you produce a book without publishing? If the book is, are there, do you, are you thinking more of private? I, I just, I'm feeling the tension here. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly I would say that if you produce, you know, three copies of something or a unique book um, or something that you conceive of as traveling in sort of a more conventional exhibition based, you know, avenue towards like an art public I, I think that that's really the gallery system, the art world, like they have constituted that public kind of determined who is going to show up and engage and how, you know, on what terms they're going to engage. I think creating a publication means that you want to have a hand in creating the terms of engagement, you know, how people are going to receive it and communicate about it with one another. Um, but I mean, I'd definitely be curious to hear what other people think too. Um, Richard Minsky just asked an interesting question, um, or you know, there's this thread going on in the um, in the chat about uh, publishing as practice. And someone asked, I think it was Molly. So if you're making your own book in an edition of 25 and you sell it at a fair, are you publishing it? And a lot of people are saying yes, yes. I would say yes. Um, and uh, 
And then Richard says, yes, if you're selling it at a fair, if you distribute it privately, this is the question, is it still publishing? If you make one copy and gift it to a lover, is it still publishing? No. I, I think of Kathy Walkup's essay, Hey Kathy, where she uh, says privishing mm. versus publishing. Mm-hmm. Which I guess is Beautiful. actually David Godin. Is that that's a David Godin term, and he he always talks about um, the publisher, the Boston publisher, and he always talks about publishing versus privishing, and he doesn't mean anything um, uh, very complimentary about the word privishing. But um, I think that uh, he's really was sort of focused on the sort of navel gazing fine press world. I think, but um, but um, I, I I always found that um, a really useful term. So thanks for bringing that up. Also thinking about, um, are we not a public? So if you publish something for yourself, is that not public enough? Are we not the first audience for what we're producing? And and just in libraries, we consider it absolutely published. It's absolutely published. If you publish one thing, if it's a unique book, you know, you are the publisher. So it's not a problem for us. <laughs> I guess I'm puzzled why it's considered a problem even. Right, and to be clear, I think that you could publish a unique, like a, a one of a kind book. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's a matter of numbers because I would also, yeah, I'd argue that there are fairly large editions of things that didn't have a great deal of thought or intention as to mm-hmm. the social relations that they are engendering among people. Um, in fact, maybe you could say most like literary trade publishing doesn't, you know, they think in terms of market share or, you know, finding their audience of consumers and targeting people um, more than thinking about like the social relationship between people. Yes, uh, sorry, but I think we shouldn't confuse the terms here. It can be a good book, it can, and it can be a bad book, but quality is not defining if it's a book or not. But if it's unique, it's not a book to me. It's a book object. A a book, it becomes if it's multiple copies. I think also the productive tension that we're all feeling here is really between at what point does it become public? At what point is it published? Uh, And for some of us here, it seems we draw the line at numbers. Uh, For some of us, we draw the line at audience. And I think this is kind of what we're trying to get at, these tensions between numbers, audience, maker, um, if there has to be an outside force involved. At what time, how do these factors influence the way we approach these objects as critics, as readers on these different levels? Mm Yeah, that's a great point, Megan. I think, um, you know, to just kind of like even extend what you just said, you know, thinking about my publishing practice before Center for Book Arts, um, you know, I worked with a lot of uh, emerging artists and we would, you know, very much collaborate with them to produce books. And sometimes they would be, you know, an edition of three, or sometimes they would be an edition of 200. And, you know, the mediums varied in the same way, Victor, that you you mentioned that Women's Studio Workshops uh, medium and format changes. But um, yeah, the question of, you know, authorship comes in also, I think, with publishers, because there are artist book publishers who are working with a really broad range of artists, but there's always this kind of signature thing. And so then if, are they similar as a publisher to a designer, for example? Um, and, and I'm wondering, you know, for the critic, where do those, where do those, um, where do those ingredients come in and how do we identify them? Yeah, and what role does the critic perhaps play to get back to some of the questions that we were we were talking about in the Google Doc? What role does the critic play in elucidating these roles or not in thinking about um, making clear the roles of the different persons involved in producing books or not? How how we kind of approach this publishing as practice as a larger thing and all these small pieces that are now becoming clear within that. Mm-hmm. That came up in our group a bunch actually. Well. Danielle made the great point of like, is there an adjacency to other difficult to define genres such as performance where it happens once and you might not be there. So I think there's that aspect to it too, of like, you know, accessibility. Uh, it, it might not have to be seen by many people to still be worthy of criticism. I think it's the one summarizing thing that we came upon in our group. 
Can I make a comment, though I'm not a moderator? Yes. I brought this up in our little group, and I think I should bring it up here. I make a lot of one-of-a-kind books, and I put together an exhibition in 1990 to 92 that circulated as a cultural presentation of the United States called Book Arts in the USA. It traveled all through Africa and Latin America with catalogs in French and Spanish and Portuguese as well as English. And all lot of them were one of a kind objects and the act of publication was the exhibition and the fact that they went through the catalog and millions of people saw these and they were published, these one of a kind unique books got more publishing to more public than many editions of 25 or 100 or 5,000 copies. And so uh, just because it's just one copy doesn't mean it's not a book and doesn't mean it's not published if you're publishing it, you know, but you can also take, you know, 10 copies and just give them to your friends. I don't know if that's publishing because it's 10, you know, but, you know, so I make books just for myself that I write in and nobody else has ever seen. Is that published? Well, Mar will get it one day because it's going to go into my archive and maybe she'll publish it or they will. But, you know, the exhibition is an act of publication. Yeah, definitely. But it's not a book, you know. Publishing, if it circulates, it's published. You know, a blog post is published. A Twitter, a Twitter post is also publishing, but it's not a book. Yeah, I'm going to agree. You make a, one painting and hang it in an exhibition anywhere. Based on that definition, that would be published. It was, it was put in front of the public. And that's not how I would use published, publication, publishing. Is it okay to speak if I'm not a moderator? Yes, yes at this point, so, if you're not a moderator, feel free to join in the conversation. I think it might've been Barbara who made the point, like as a librarian, you know, we call the artist, the publisher, if they made this thing, right? And I do think that, that whether we use a word is context specific, like, in the context of librarianship and book cataloging, yes, someone who you know publish, makes their own unique artist book, they're the publisher because there's a field called publisher and you put them in that field. And so like, you can't just say in the abstract, something is or is not a book. In some circumstances, it might not be a book. And in other circumstances, it is a book, whether you personally believe it should be a book or not. Like in the library where I work, sometimes we catalog things in the manuscript collection and sometimes we catalog them in the book collection. And that is a determining factor whether anyone has an opinion about what should or should not be in those categories. So I think it's really important that, that you know, to say a unique book is not a book just in general is actually not true. Like whether, whether we want what we want to be a book or want not to be a book doesn't really matter um, because it's, it's, it's context specific. Peter is bringing something up, I think that came up. Uh, maybe it's the same Barbara that you're referring to. There was a Barbara in my group as well, also a librarian who made an important point about trying to find a balance in cataloging systems for both content and form. And I think to Molly's point right now, these kind of broad generalizations ignore the fact that we do need to find a balance for both content and form. So a painting is not like a book because the form is different. And thinking about these nuances um, are also important and why these kind of new languages for classification systems is also something we're trying to think about as part of this long, larger conversation, some kind of shared vocabulary so that we kind of understand the lineage of the terms we're using as critics and writers and artists so that we can then lead to better descriptions and approaches to writing about these materials. I'd also mention that it's a book. Uh, it's, it's published if you exhibit it is a legal question also. And if you check with the copyright law, you will find that exhibition is an act of publication for copyright purposes. So uh, for uh, uh, whatever your opinion might be in a court of law, it will constitute publication. 
That actually, I was going to kind of talk about like the idea that there's like specific definitions or traditions of publication too. Um, but that also like as a thought experiment, thinking about, you know, different types of publication, you know, for the role of the critic and going back to that idea of like the artist's intention, um, you know, whether the artist is engaging with publishing as a practice versus just producing books would be maybe a publisher that creates a series or serialized, you know, group of artist publications or artist books that the critic would receive, you know, as like an entire body or think of them, you know, as a set or as a series versus a publisher who as like a fundraising effort lets you do a subscription thing where every month you give them money and then four times a year they send you books. And there's examples of both of these, right? And I think it would be sort of unfair like as a critic, if you were to subscribe or to receive these books that were not intended either by the artist or initially by the publisher to be serialized or to be thought of as something that people receive, you know, together or in a series or, you know, in even a set order, um, you know, to kind of weigh those with the, the critical eye that you would bring to a true serial publication seems off somehow. So if there's like, and so that to me, that does seem like a difference between publication as a practice versus what could be called, you know, subscription or publishing as just a business model. I'd love to go back to um, the artist books versus artist publication uh, sort of rigmarole that we were on before. And um, just bring, I just want to sort of ask the group as in general is that is considering the audience with which you're trying to connect important when deciding which words to use? Because I think when we're using a term like publication, we have to acknowledge that sort of the colloquial understanding of publication does not necessarily mean a book object. So if we're trying to communicate our point to a broader audience, a term like book, artist's book, or a book object, or anything that sort of includes that B-O-O-K word in it, will have a much clearer sort of picture for sort of a broader audience to understand what type of object we're talking about. And I feel like in the writing that I do, I feel like that's a very important part is connecting with an audience and getting them interested about the objects that we are talking about. Um, and I just, I don't feel like publication would have that same level of connection. Barbara's giving you a thumbs up. <laughs> I think, um, oh, sorry, Karina, did you wanna? No, go ahead, Megan. I was just gonna say, I feel like that that nuance in terms of artist publication versus artist book also gets back to what we were talking about from the first discussion um, about specific, first discussion today about specific terminology in terms of what we mean when we say activist and the nuance between activist and political, like an activist work and a political work in is sort of the kind of same nuance we're talking about different meanings but same nuance of artist publication versus artist book again it gets to audience and what we're trying to convey when we use these terms which is why i think it's so great that we're all here kind of just sharing our different backgrounds on these especially for me and my background in art history and criticism i have all these ideas in mind but hearing all of your opinions it's so great to uh, get familiar with the connotations that these terms have for different audiences, different readers, writers, and makers. And that's what's so important in trying to figure out how to develop a new way and a new form of criticism for artist books. So thank you all. Um, was anyone in the uh, session last night that is not a discussion instigator this session that wants to make any interesting connections for us. Or Kayla, I know you were a discussion instigator last night as well. And I'm yeah. curious if um, if you or maybe Colette wants to, um, you know, help us thread some of those uh, themes through. Levi was also here for both. So I know he's gotten to okay. speak a bit more. Can you actually ask your question again? I'm so sorry. I'm just, I'm just curious if, if there are any um, connections that you think can be made between our conversation during the convening session last night and what we've been talking about tonight. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's like all cart before the horse. Um, I mean, does it help to define the terms in order to archive things, in order to understand why we need to create a framework, in order to understand distribution? So I can speak to my own experience, which came up in my breakout session, running an art bookstore. We're not distributors, but we do help facilitate the, per, you know, in some ways distributing local artist books, which are zines, that when they sell out, they're probably never going to, you know, recirculate. Mm -hmm. um, but then we also work with larger circulations of short run prints and presses that are in editions of a thousand and they come from all over the world. So I feel like there are ways that we are mediating between the worlds of the publisher and the artist all the time. And that those are like really a lot of overlap, a lot of gray area and really fuzzy boundaries that are shifting all the time, mm -hmm. um, depending on the project. So a lot of times I'm thinking about like, what's the through line? I said this, it's like, <laughs> it's a shifting through line um, that comes around that like, to me, I think that came up a lot is like uh, what publishing is a vehicle that you have some control over around, you know, presenting your ideas in the public. Um, but I think, I don't know. So I think, I don't know if that's helpful. Colette, maybe I can pass it to you and that you brought up a great like Marxist point of just asking questions around like, you know, right. who made it. Yeah. Right, right, right. Passing the well, baton. I, I think it's all really fascinating. And this form really crosses over um, people and genres and institutions that have had a, a range of intentions. And, um, you know, you have the institution of the library and I see how fiercely people in the library care about uh, terms and names. I, if that makes complete sense. But at the same time, a lot of book art activity is this kind of underground, especially when you're talking about activist work, is this underground guerrilla you know, off the grid activity and how do you get those two things to match up? I, they, I don't think they will or should. That's my opinion. And that's not a bad thing. I'll add that. <laughs> I think one thing that came up at the end of Paul Suelis's urgent publishing um, conversation earlier today that kind of has been lingering with me that resonates with, Col with what Colette has just said is this idea of certain types of publishing, particularly activist publishing, as being purposefully or intentionally against the institution, against the green, but then also part of the problem we're dealing with right now in these sessions and the hope of this whole initiative is to um, recontextualize artist books and rewrite that legacy that has been historically uh, very white male conceptual art driven. So it's in some ways, how do we bring these types of materials into the institution without institutionalizing them? Yeah, I mean, that also reminds me of the conversation that was happening in Zine Steganography earlier today, um, where they're talking about, you know, the, the fact that so many um, activist artists and, and activists in general uh, have a need to mask their work through encoding it or um, just in order to even be heard. And so there is something really fascinating about, you know, if you do document that, does it does it sometimes put people at risk? Does it bring a public to work that maybe doesn't want a public? Um, and you know, whose whose job is it to make that decision? Is it the artist or is it the critic? Is it the librarian? I mean, obviously it's flexible, but I'm curious. Yeah, Nina. Um, Nina says in the chat here, I think language is important so that we can critically think about dis and discuss artist books, art history and book history. Um, they all have their own language. Um, 
which is why the identity crisis isn't as obvious as it, as it is in the book arts world. So I think having these discussions is really important. And I think it's true. I think we need to have more conversations like this. Um, you know, tonight we've, we've, I've let us go over time a little bit and um, I'm really grateful for all of the discussion instigators and all of the participants and all of the various um, viewpoints that were shared tonight. Um, you know, Megan and Dave and I, as well as the whole CABC team, um, you know, we've been really thinking a lot about this. We've been thinking about language, we've been thinking about publics, we've been thinking about accessibility, and we've been thinking about, um, you know, how do you broaden in a way that feels, um, you know, true and, and respectful, and at the same time, you know, it doesn't feel, um, overbearing in any sense. And so, you know, we're, we're very interested in if you all have additional comments or if you wanna continue these conversations with us, you all have a link to that Google doc. And um, so, you know, you'll have that as a resource, but I also encourage you, you know, after our conversation tonight to add comments to that same document, we're gonna leave it up online. Um, you know, try not to uh, edit the, the main body of the text, but, you know, add a, add a, add a comment to it. If you wanna be in dialogue with the other groups, or if you think of something that we didn't have a chance to address tonight. Um, and if you're all interested in, you know, participating in more things like this, please, you know, send us an email, reach out to CBA, um, reach out to BAR, B-A-R at centerforbookarts.org. Um, we're always looking for new writers um, as we continue to develop the publication. And, um, you know, we're working on, thank you, Megan. Um, we're working on developing resources. So we, we welcome as much support and help in that as, as is available. So um, thank you everyone. We're so grateful. And um, with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna release you, uh, but I'm gonna leave the chat or I'm gonna leave the Zoom room open. So if anybody wants to, to chat as we go, feel free.